organized by uh, so big data plus plus which is a european project which strives to deliver a distributed and pan-european multidisciplinary research infrastructure for uh, big social data analytics and uh, social data, so big data plus plus also pursues grand societal challenges laid out in the so-called exploratories which are research frameworks in which scientific research is developed within the project specifically the project has uh, nine exploratories and around 30 partners uh, companies universities and so on all around europe today's webinar is related to a very interesting topic big data and human migration and it is moderated by uh, laura pollacci uh, postdoc at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Pisa, and Matteo Bom, PhD student at University Sapiens of Rome. Laura and Matteo are um, community activists for the Migration Studies Exploratory, one of the main exploratories in the infrastructure. And within the Migration Studies Exploratory, researchers of so big data study topics related to human migration. Uh, our invited speaker is Tuba Birkan, but I leave now the word to Laura and Matteo, who will introduce our invited speaker and the topics covered in today's webinar. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Luca. And thank you all for being here and thank you also to, to Tuba. Well, Tuba Birkan works in the research group of social and economic policy and social inclusion at uh, Q11. She is a researcher in uh, evidence-based and policymaking uh, research methods, European project, data management, uh, quantitative analysis, and so on. Also, she is very, very active in big data for social research and uh, interdisciplinary studies uh, such as migration studies, and she is the first lady of the European project uh, Unbird, and the project uh, aims um, to study the origin of migration, the relation with the tendency of people to migrate with geography and so on. And uh, today, Tuba uh, asks us an important question. So, can big data bridge gaps in migration statistics? So we will know that traditional data on uh, international migration suffer from very um, uh, a lot uh, various sorry various gaps uh, and uh, inconsistencies in definition, in coverage, in time, and so on. Uh, true, there are also new official data sources, but they remain unused, and uh, and then there are the big data. Well, today Tuba uh, will discuss the existing gaps and shortcomings and uh, in the migration statistics and how we can use this uh, big data. Uh, thank you all and enjoy the binary. Uh, so thanks a lot, Laura. Uh, I will start with a brief explanation of who I am like adding on top of what Laura said. I'm affiliated at Kyle Leuven, right at Tihiba, but um, I'm also a uh, professor in sociology at the Free University of Brussels. Uh, I've been working on migration, if you talk about the content, and equal opportunities and policy making. And from the methodological point of view, I'm a mixed methods researcher, but I'm very much interested in the new methods and approaches, including big data and ML techniques, as well as how to study how to reach groups. So today, um, I am not 100% sure of the overall background. I do see different names, some are familiar, but I assume that, uh, yeah, most of you are from data science or computer science background, although I do have some colleagues on board as well from the social sciences. Um, so um, today's uh, webinar is about really trying to answer the question, can big data help? The bridge the gaps and um i'm not gonna teach you what you already know so it's not really about claiming uh big words on the utilization of the big data because most of you have already been working with big data or some about techniques or really something related to human mobility today we are going to question some concepts which are being granted that we already yeah i assume that we already know when we are studying migration and human mobility. 
So today's outline is in fact threefold, and they all depend on the same question. So our main question is, can big data average the gaps in migration statistics? So we're going to start with um, talking about what I mean, what we mean by migration statistics. If everything is going well there, so do we understand the same things when we are referring to the measures or statistics of migration? And then we are going to discuss the gaps, you know, the shortcomings, you know, like where big data can really be uh, uh, of help. And then we will um, talk a little bit about existing studies, you know, like some attempts, because uh, we are not the first ones or the only ones who are working with big data or AI to address some challenges or let's say societal challenges of human mobility challenges. So of course, then we will wrap up with, uh, yeah, how we can answer this question. So as I said, we are going to have a kind of conceptual start because I would like to raise the uh, issue of what is migration? What do we mean by migrants? Because migration, according to Eurostat, there are several definitions, but most of us uh, always refer to the United Nations definition or the Eurostat definition, which are very much alike. And um, from the Eurostat, we say that migration refers to the number of migrants. So people changing their residence to or from a specific region, it's usually a country, and given a period of time, and usually it's annual. So, um, which brings us to the question, okay, it's a quantification of people who are called migrants. But I'd like to challenge that a little bit. Because when we look at the available sources for the migration statistics, there are some main institutes who are collecting and providing data and statistics on migration on a regular basis. So we have international data sources like UNDESA, OECD, IOM, which is also part of the uh, UN, it is the um, Institute of the International Organization for Migration, I forgot the name. Um, we have Eurostat, we have UNHCR, which is working with the refugee and asylum seekers. We do have Frontex, which collects data on the borders. But in addition to that, we also uh, work with some national data collectors, which are mainly the national statistical offices. Most of the time, they do work with some ministries, like um, if they have a immigration office or exterior affairs or sometimes internal affairs. So as you see, there are plenty of sources and there are plenty of migration statistics already publicly available to all of us. But what we find there in terms of migration is pretty restricted. So when you refer to migration statistics, we mostly talk about inflows, outflows, and the number of present people. So inflows and outflows are the migration flows, which means how many, you know, usually in a given time refers to one year, for instance, in 2019, how many people have arrived to Belgium or how many people have left Italy, of course, on a registry basis. And then the stocks, we will discuss it later, it is about the total population of a specific group which we call migrants. In addition to that, because these are available on a global level, um, on the EU level, Eurostat collects data about the residence permits, which means once you decide to move into an EU country, you need to apply for a visa at embassy. So based on your reason, they grant you the visa and the residence permits. So we do have that information as well. So, and these are the measures that we have, but we also have the definitions. So when I said that we are talking about number of migrants, in fact, we always, in terms of statistics, refer to non-nationals or foreign votes. So the non-nationals is the statistics that we uh, collect by the country of citizenship. So if you think that I am a migrant, you can check what my nationality is and that, or you can check where I was born. 
So the foreign born and the non-nationals are usually the stocks that we talk about in terms of the migration statistics. But when we refer to the country of birth, we have the statistics for the first generation. What I mean by the first generation is that it is in fact the person who moved. That's our assumption. But we all know that when we think about the migrants and the migration concept in general, especially in the, in the EU, we refer to further generations, which we call descendants of migrants. So it's a very basic starting question before we go in deep on the techniques, how to elaborate what we have is who is a migrant. So um, just with a very basic Google search, these are the images that I get for a migrant. So as you know that Google search depends on the uh, uh, user inputs. So these are the photos that have been mostly tagged for migrant or migration. And um, yeah, I would say that they are pretty homogeneous. Just, uh, you know, like we have two of them, you know, like with this, the solidarity for all workers on the bottom. And then on the left hand side, we have this illustration of the migrant workers. But in general, we, we see boats, we see as different ethnic origins, mostly black people and with the life vests. So this is the perception of a migrant. You can say that, yeah, but is it really the case? No, I do know different people. Yes, you might be right. But this is the generic understanding. But it is very different with what we have in the migration statistics. So I'd like to have a little quiz. I do know that you will not be able to respond. And that's the worst part of this having things online. I really like in person, but um, I would like to ask you to think of the groups, you know, like I just gave a bunch of EU countries. So Belgium, Germany, Spain, France, Italy, Netherlands, Austria, UK and Switzerland. So um, in the first column, you do see the total number of non-national. So this is the data that is available on Eurostat for 2019. And we do see that, of course, I didn't give here the total population, but uh, like in Belgium, we are 11 million. So it's almost 10% the non-nationals and it follows. Like for Italy, we do have more than 5 million non-Italians who are officially registered and residing in Italy. So, um, I can say that uh, I don't know if we do have anyone from Belgium here, but in the Belgian case, most of my students also make the first guess of Turkish and Moroccans, because these two are the main groups who are residing in Belgium, and most of the people think that they are the migrants. So in Germany, I think, yeah, many people would think Turks first as well. In France, maybe some Algerians you would think of, and in UK, maybe some Indians, but let's have a look with the first dominant group. In Belgium, it is the French. And in Germany, it is the Polish and Spain, Romanians. And in Italy, it's Romanians as well. And when you follow up the second group, it is, yeah, we started to see some, uh, you know, like guesses, but in Italy, it is the Albanians, like for instance, and Romanians appear in the UK again, the first group, the fourth group and the fifth group. I think it's very interesting to see some interesting groups. Look, we have Romanians everywhere. We do have Germans everywhere. We do have Chinese, which have been barely pronounced when we are talking about the overall discourse and like public and political discourse. So in fact, we do not see that many non-EUs, yeah, we have the Algerians, Albanians and Indians, but and Chinese. I have to say that this this picture is a little bit different than the first image that pops up in our mind, and it is different than what you see in the Google. So uh, I think it already shows you that how things appear in the statistics might be different than the imaginary or subjective understanding, but which is the correct one? So which one shall we rely on? I have a question because um, we do know that there is a difference between a refugee and the migrant. Okay, so uh, refugees are the ones who move to another country because 
uh, their life is threatened due to several uh, reasons in their home country. So they ask for an asylum to live in there. But the migrants, when we refer to the migrants and regular migrants in general, we refer to people who voluntarily move to another country. So we have two people here. The first one is a Belgian national, and the second one is a German national. So if we go to the statistics, migration statistics, if I'm checking for these migrant groups, these migrant groups, and I check for the nationality, these people are not migrants because these are EU. And in most of the studies, uh, we refer to non-EU migrants as the migrants. So, okay, Belgian and German, that doesn't tell me much. Okay, let me check the country of birth. Okay, the first one is from Syria. That person was, in, was born in Syria. And the other person was born in Turkey. So, um, I will ask you to think of if these people are natives or migrants or refugees, or are they different? So if we look at those two people, I, you, you're not going to recognize them, but the first person is called, he is a friend of mine, Mohamed Salman. He is a Belgian national. He was born in Syria and he is not a refugee as many of others think immediately when they hear his name or when they check where he was born. He came to Belgium to pursue a PhD before the war and he's been here since. The second person is a Turkish born person in Germany, which many of uh, you or people might think that a regular Turkish migrant in Germany, but he is a very famous journalist from Turkey who is a refugee currently in Belgium. As you do see, you know, like the measures that we have for the official statistics for migration, country of birth and country of nationality might fail us. And these are not just a bunch of samples. The numbers are really significant not to be ignored. Let's go for another example. Now we have the same nationality in Belgium. So we have two Belgian nationals and one of them was born in Belgium and the other one was born in Congo, which was a former colony of Belgium. So according to statistics, because we work with anonymized statistics, these guys were coded as migrants or natives. And when we look at those guys, the first person is Orhan Arda, uh, by his name, he is uh, um, a second generation migrant with a Turkish background, but he was born in Belgium, he was raised in Belgium, he is Belgian. And then Professor Ides Nikese, he is a Belgian, but he was born in Congo. So it is, I think, another example to show that it is very difficult to differentiate the natives, refugees, and the migrants just with the measures in hand. They're pretty tri tricky. So uh, after illustrating, you know, like what might be wrong with the statistics that we rely on so much, I'd like to start with this, um, let's say, social aspect of the statistics. Because for the policymaking on national level, level or the EU level, we do call these evidence-based policymaking, or sometimes they are called data-driven policymaking. And we do rely on data. We assume that data is reliable, data is valid, and we can make more inclusive, fair, and, and better social policies to have a better society. But we do know that, especially for the migration statistics, there are several shortcomings that is not easily to be overlooked. So uh, especially for the migration statistics, we will discuss five points, definitions and typologies, drivers, demography, gender and population, geography and temporal temporality. Why is it important to know the gaps? Because it is where the big data can help us to improve. And yeah, we'll see to what extent we can do that. So as we discussed, defining a migrant might be very tricky, but what you're going to see in many research is that 
they just have a short sentence here or there saying that, yeah, we define migrants as non-nationals. We define migrants as foreign wolves. Or most of the time they say, yeah, we refer to UN data, we refer to Eurostat data. So what migrant is a multidimensional and a diverse concept when you talk about a mig migrant, a person who migrated. In fact, we are talking about different definitions and categories. We are talking about first internal migration, international migration and transnational migration. In the EU case, we also have intra-European migration because internal migration refers to migration within the country, intra-European between the EU countries, international as you might guess, because intra-European is also part of international, but in most of the social studies, you'll see that they do refer to third country nationals. And then there is a transnational migration. So you might say that, yeah, but what is, yeah, what is the difference? When you think about temporary and permanent migration, I think we should also bring in the concept of mobility, which has been used very frequently by many quantitative papers, but mobility and migration, they are different. Just to give you a very basic example from my own, um, I am a migrant myself. I was born in Turkey, I was raised in Turkey, then I moved to Germany. I lived in Germany for two years, and then I moved to Belgium, and now I've been living in Belgium. I do have the Belgian nationality as well, but I was born in Turkey, so according to statistics, I'm a migrant. But when you look at my partner, he is Turkish originally. He was born in Turkey, he was raised there, he, he lived in Italy, then he moved to Belgium. So now we do live in Belgium, but he works in Germany, so every day, you know, like before COVID, he used to commute to Germany. So it's a cross-border cross mobility, but he is based in Belgium. So mobility refers to temporary movement, but it doesn't refer to temporary migration because temporary migration is like a seasonal migrant who flew, you know, like who flies from Romania to the UK for the season, for the agricultural work, and then they go back to their home country. So it requires residence, but if you do have, if you, do, if you are mobile on a regular basis, it is not necessarily the migration. And then uh, we briefly touched the voluntary and involuntary ones. Uh, you know, sometimes in the statistics, you do see it like irregular or let's say managed migration as well. So we do have the voluntary, voluntary migrants who chose themselves to go and live in a different country and we do have the involuntary or forced migration where people are forced to leave their countries and seek asylum or a residence in a different country so mostly uh, most of the people are confusing the voluntary involuntary to regular with irregular migration because you might want to leave your country without papers then it is a irregular migration so um, voluntary and involuntary refers to the drivers, but regular and irregular refers to the registers. And I have to say that we do not have a lot of information about the voluntary and I mean the differences between the voluntary, involuntary and regular, irregular, because we do have statistics for the voluntary migration through the residence permits, involuntary migration with the asylum applications, but Irregular and irregular migrants. Irregular migrants are the undocumented ones. These are these might be asylum seekers who have not a, a applied for asylum yet, or who who go to a country, wait there for a while, then decide to go somewhere. So these people do not appear on papers. Going back to the migration statistics, we only can talk about people who appear on the registers. Having said that, I think which is very interesting is that we there are many migrants in the limbo of categories. So on the basic statistics, we define uh, migrants like economic migrants. So because these are the drivers that we will discuss. So they have some reasons, but we have people, let's say refugees and asylum seekers, return migration, environmental migration, lifestyle migration, like environmental migration, environmental migrants have been pronounced everywhere like a myth. <laughs> but we do not see them. They do not appear on any statistics. We do not know how to compare it. We don't know what, how can we do the robustness check with the new estimates that we come up with because these people are only on the concept in the political rhetoric and on media and public discourse. So, but 
we have a concept of environmental migrants or the return migration. So it is not very easy to track. Return migration means, uh, if you remember in the beginning of 90s, there, after the Yugoslavian conflict, there were a lot of um, Bosnians, Kosovians uh, moved to uh, you, the Western Europe, but then after a while they were kind of forced to go back. So return migration is a different concept, which can also be very difficult to capture. Or yeah, the refugees and asylum seekers, I will give you a very simple example. Assume that I am a refugee here in Belgium and I would like to bring my family here. So they apply in, you know, like Syria, Afghanistan or Venezuela, wherever, uh, to the embassy to come and join me. When they come to Belgium, they are not refugees. They are not asylum seekers. They are family migrants. So although we are running away from the same thing, the driver is the same. They just come to join me because I was granted the asylum. So these guys are registered on the family migrants. So we do not see this family, this family in the statistics of the refugees. Or the lifestyle migration, um, a very nice uh, example was elaborated in our report uh, written by uh, Salamanca team. I think Miko is also here and Carlos. So um, yeah, there are British pensioners who move to Spanish islands or Spain or different countries just to enjoy their retirement. And this became a lifestyle, so they don't need to move. So nothing, it's just because they would like to have a change in their lifestyle. It is also very difficult to capture these people in the statistics as well. And for the drivers, based on register, based on the statistics, we have the remunerated activities entrepreneurs. You usually hear them like economic migrants. We hear the educational migrants. We do have the family unification or reunification and we have the humanitarian migration. So. If you look at the statistics, you have to fit in one of those. So you're either an economic migrant or a student, international student, or you're going there to unify with your family or you're an asylum seeker or someone under temporary protection. The challenge here is that we cannot track the changes. I don't know how many of you, I mean, I know Jisoo and she is not Italian, at least yet. So she came to Italy for something. So you can have a student who moves to a country, then gets a job or gets married or decided to settle down. So they change status. So they were not educational migrants anymore, but we cannot track it in the statistics. So you cannot really go and check how many of these, uh, I mean, you know, you, we cannot track the status change of the people. So we don't know their trajectories. Are they migrants or not? So, um, after talking about these definitions and typologies and very complex typologies, we have the demography. Here, I would like to put gender a bit further because it's not only about sex, okay? So in the statistics, gender is always represented by sex. However, from, from uh, we have to be aware that gender refers to more than your biological sex. So it is about the gender roles in the community and the society as well. So um, the hidden populations might be through the gender or some ethnic background. To be more specific, if you look at the statistics, we do have the binary of sex. So the gender, I mean, biological sex, you're either female or male. Yeah, there are some sometimes unknown, sometimes others, but non-binary, you know, like genders are, I mean, sex are not included there. And uh, for the hidden populations like travelers, or the Roma people, they do not appear on the statistics a lot. So in fact, the migration statistics give us a very nice big picture, but for the part that we mostly already know about. And uh, going back to the significance of data for social policy making, to, to have equal opportunities and more, more inclusive policies, we do need to address the challenges by the vulnerable groups. And when I say vulnerable or disadvantaged groups, these people are usually these marginal groups, not marginal in terms of you know, culture because they do not appear on statistics. And usually they are the ones who are most in need. So it's very crucial that we have to know more about these groups. You know, we have to 
think about feminization of migration, we need to think about, okay, when we look at the asylum statistics, less than 15% are female. But what happens to those people? Is it really the 15% starts the journey and ends up in Europe? I don't think so. We do know that at least in the African route, we are talking about sex trafficking. We are talking about the very rough conditions who, re who I mean, which really gets the travel very difficult for women. Or now we do know that in the Eastern Europe, Bosnia has been one of the main transaction points for the human smugglers. So we do know these things conceptually, but we do not see it in the data. And unfortunately, policy is usually based on data. So um, we are talking about this education migrants, as I told you, you know, like these people change status, they change countries. So it's very difficult and they are very smart in making their ways out, but we are not smart enough to track, to keep the track of their movements. For the labor migrants, it's changing very rapidly because um, you might assume that, you know, like it's very easy to go and check some statistics for brain drain, but it is not because of some privacy issues or for some country preferences in the statistics, we do not have the information of education. We have the information age, sex, country of birth, country of nationality, but we don't know the education information. So we can come up with some proxies, let's say mm, if that person applied for an economic visa, a work permit, yeah, that person will be a highly skilled migrant. And there are some attempts to solve that, but the statistics, at least the traditional data now, fails in there. In addition to that, we do know that within, within Europe, there are a lot of contract workers who have been affected significantly during the COVID just because they were working with some subcontractors and they are not really visible in the system. That's why it is very difficult to address their challenges and the problems. And even within the humanitarian one, you know, what we know for the refugees, for instance, yes, Greece and Italy, they are the, you know, like first and um, with with Spain now, these countries are the first arrival points, but it is very different. You know, like some people prefer to stay in that country for almost a year without registering anywhere. So these people are there, but we don't see them on registers. But in some cases, they go to a country and then they apply, but then they decide to leave. So some of them are declined. So the humanitarian visa doesn't work as smooth as it is portrayed. It's very difficult. And the Roma migrants and travelers, as I said, especially in the in your Ireland and UK, you know, like they are more systematic. So, it, it, you know, like the we do know the spatial distribution where they live. Some data is there, but it is very difficult to track them within the EU. Yeah, there are some attempts, though, but yeah, challenging. And there is a category which, yeah, we can talk about for hours, which is the others. This is like the black box of the uh, statistics because these people are we don't know who. So it is different for every country. And you might say that, yeah, but you know, we can ignore it. Others constitute almost one third of the total migrants. So we do not have the sufficient information, all, you know, like 30% of the migrant population, which is not, you know, like covering enough, but yet, even in that one, we don't know yeah, there are some insights. We do know that some of them are under temporary protection. Some of them are, let's like, say, assume that you live in a country, your residence permit expired with the bureaucracy, you had to stay there three more months until it is renewed. So then you drop into the other's box, but then you're taken out again. So the other is this little black box that takes care of everything and ignored very significantly. However, I just want to repeat because it's really striking. These are the 30% of the overall migrants. So we move to geography and space and you might think that, yeah, so what, you know, like if you talk about Europe, yeah, it's the Eurostat, European countries and some neighbors. If you think about global, yeah, we have the UN, but it is a bit beyond that because from in, in social sciences, you know, like uh, we started with the static sociology and now we are going into mobility because now migration is not a static thing anymore. So it's not like, okay, with an agreement between Germany and let's say Turkey, people from Turkey came to Germany to work or Italians came to Belgium to work. So it's not that straightforward. 
we do know that it's pollute and it, with the especially for the eu the intra-european mobility and freedom of movement and then we also need to think of this multiple locations because it's not that people are born in one country live there and decide to go and live somewhere else they change places and it is very very vibrant as i gave you the example you might be someone who is living in a country i mean luxembourg is one of the countries with the highest migrant rates it's uh more than 50 percent and there despite that most of the people who are working in the luxembourg they do not live in luxembourg they do live in belgium they do live in france or they do live in Germany. So it, it gets more and more complicated to think about the geography as well. And the second thing which is very important is um, maybe not all of you are very familiar with this uh, nationalism and transnationalism, but to make it simple, you know, we always talked about identities like citizenship, belonging. This was the way how we defined the migrants, where they belong, how they identify themselves. But now we are referring to something more fluid again, and transnationalism refers to the migration processes. And regional, regional locatedness is about this. When you look at the statistics, we do see the special distributions. Okay. And we, we try to see the patterns. But when you look at this geography from a bit uh, further spot, you will see that these are nice concepts that we can talk for hours, but it is not possible to capture with data, at least the traditional data. So I will come to the last point, which has been um, pronounced the most with the use of big data, because the data, the conventional data, traditional data sources have issues with temporality and the timeliness. So usually they are late and the lags are something sometimes too significant. And it doesn't capture this fluid and temporal aspect of migration, because as you remember, the statistics are for one year, okay? So what happens in the one year, they collect the data at the end of the year. So if someone moved to uh, Sweden, lived there six months, then moved out, that person will not appear in the statistics because the, the previous year's statistics were from the 31st of December, 2019, and this year will be 31st of December. So what happens in that one year, we do not, capture it and then um it doesn't really as i said capture the process because of this time and also uh, the question that i find extremely important to ask is when do you stop when do we or when someone stops to be a migrant so now we are talking about the second generation in europe third generation in europe i have a colleague who is the first generation and to be honest yeah, that person is not very happy with being called a migrant because her grandparents were born in Belgium. So when are we going to stop? Because in order to capture this migrant aspect, what, what is happening is with the census and the micro census data, we try to track the family distance, you know, like, okay, the country of birth of that person, Belgium, go one generation further. Oh, parents, oh, they were also born in Belgium, one step further grandparents oh they were also born in belgium but why do we need to do this and until when we have to do that so um in the legal status is not enough but we do have to question why not so who decides on that and finally the humanitarian crisis, which require really rapid responses like political conflicts or climate change, environmental factors, disasters, or epidemiology and pandemics, uh, as we are in one of. So um, the traditional statistics cannot respond at the same pace. So it is a really, really, really lagged period. And uh, we will now think about okay nice the traditional data is not as good as we assume but what we can do it first of all we cannot ignore what we have because that's the best for now and we are trying to make use of that the maximum advantage but there are some ways or some attempts and first i would like to discuss with the basics what has been done but then we will also let's say criticize a bit where do they fill in the gaps that we have discussed so far. 
So I will not refer to the other big data sources. Like I do know that there are also, let's say, financial records, some banking data, sometimes marketing data. But now uh, most of the studies who are working migration, but in fact, mostly human mobility, they do use the three types, social media data, or let's say internet based mostly because they also do some IP web searches, emails, search engines. We have the mobile phone data, CDRs usually, you know, they call data records and sometimes XDRs or the mobile phone uh, transfers, I mean mobile money transfers. And then we have the sensor base. So this is a satellite imagery. So it depends on where on the globe you are because in the States, so they use different uh, satellites, but in the EU, we usually refer to Sentinel-1 and 2. So there are, I mean, for the social media, the usual suspects, you know, like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google, Foursquare, so it goes more and more. So, Let's refer to each gap one by one. So referring to the definition of typologies and drivers, we said that it's pretty messy there and we can only talk about non-nationals and non-count, you know, like foreign votes, but we have to go beyond that. But can big data help to do that? There are millions of studies, you know, like I'm not going to refer to all of them. I just put here some of the ones that I find kind of uh, recent and interesting but you can find more examples. So I do know that like Burma et al, uh, they worked with the Google Trends Index. So they tried to see the intention of migration, okay? So they don't talk about drivers, it's just the intention. And what they do is they're trying to see where people are intended to go and from where to where. So uh, another one from like any uh, Ingmar and Weber, they use the web, and the email sent to see like if the email sending activity can be used to estimate international mobility patterns so what do we know i mean what do they mean by the international mobility patterns in fact they are again talking about the they they compare the result the results with the non-national so the, the statistics only and then connor they work with the google trends data they want to see the arrivals of asylum seekers, so they try to compare if their estimations are, let's say, in line with their real statistics in Europe, but also in Australia. And uh, Hughes et al., they work with the, they combine the social media data with the mobile phone data, and they included a lot of social media in there, and they try to infer migration and international migration flows, okay, in the in the European Union. And then stated all in 2014, they work with the geo liquidated career histories by LinkedIn. And yeah, I do know that, um, you know, like uh, the, I will discuss about Hummingbird, I mean, a couple of colleagues at the PISA, and they also work on using LinkedIn to estimate highly skilled. So yeah, as you see here, they, they did a lot with different types of data, but they always tried to estimate the non-nationals, okay? So in terms of definition, all the gaps that we are referring to are still there. So for the demography, uh, for the education of migrants, I told you that we do not have the data, but there are very nice attempts as I discussed. So yeah, we can work with ORCID or LinkedIn data to see, you know, like uh, where people studied, where they worked, so we can really track the educated or highly educated people. And for the humanitarian and for Roma migrants and travelers, yes, there are some studies about those people. And the humanitarian, there are many, I will discuss more. And, uh, but about the labor migrants, about the family migrants, I mean, to my knowledge, I haven't came across too many studies on that. So there are still big lacks as, and also about the others. And for the geography and space, I think, yeah, we do it quite well. When I say we did, you know, like people who are into use of big data there, I mean, the, the picture that you see here is from the European Space Agency's uh, feasibility study of big data. And they really try to see what's going on in Africa. I think it's an important step. I mean, this is the out output of the feasibility study, but now they started the real study. So they try to monitor the routes within Africa. I think it's an enormous uh, 
as an enormous contribution because it reflects to the process that we discussed, but only for Africa. And of course, there are some pros and cons there because they work with the satellite data and it's much easier to uh, follow and to observe. Like, you know, like Africa, it is it gets a little more difficult when you go to the urban areas. But yet it is uh, it already talks a lot about the smuggling and the coastal monitoring. So they try to address humanitarian, but also the trajectories. And there is also, I mean, Queen et al, they work the satellite imagery for displacement and the refugee settlements. And the refugee settlements are the refugee camps, you know, like um, so they also check the infrastructure damages after the natural disasters. So you do see that, you know, like different gaps are, you know, like touched from different perspectives. And as I said, temporality and the timeliness, I think it's one of the best uh, or the strongest um, characteristics of the big data because it's real time data most of the time. And we do see that it works pretty well, especially with the humanitarian and the uh, hum yeah, humanitarian and disasters and environmental things. Cause you know, like uh, Blue Monster get all, they worked, they tried to understand the aftermath of the earthquake in 2008 in Rwanda, but we have plenty, plenty of examples for COVID. But I have to draw your attention to that. Look at tracking human mobility, mobility changes in Italy, like how mobile phone data can guide government and authorities. So in all of the cases, big data were extremely useful for the mobility. And it was very timely, so it was a huge help. But if we really talk about if these helped to improve the migration statistics or how to collect regular statistics, yeah, I would say no. <laughs> so um, I'll draw your attention uh, towards the end of my presentation to the Hummingbird Project. Um, Hummingbird Project is a Horizon 2020 project which started yeah, almost a year ago. It is the advanced uh, enhanced migration measures from a multidimensional perspective. It is a mixed methods research. So we do work also with enormous qualitative data. So it is going to combine qualitative and quantitative. And in the quantitative, we have the traditional data sources and these new I mean, the big data sources and the alternative methods, but I will only refer to the um, the big data applications that we will do and uh, like what we are going to do in terms of improving the knowledge in terms of statistics, we will estimate the migrant stocks with Twitter and Facebook at API. We will work with seasonal migration with the air traffic data. We will try to estimate the highly skilled migration, so the education of the migrants through LinkedIn and Orsit. And then we are going to work on Somalia with the satellite images, which is to, let's say, to assess if we can come up with the factors that might induce migration and human mobility. So, and finally, we are gonna work with a mobile phone data with the CDR data analysis in um, Istanbul to to estimate the number of refugee number of Syrians, yeah, uh, we do hear that Turkey is the country with, uh, that hosts most of the refugees, but not all of them are registered. So unofficial numbers says that we do have almost, or maybe more than five million, but the official statistics say three and a half million. So these people entered to Turkey from the border legally, but somehow they get lost in the registration system because like they need to pay to be registered at the municipality for the residence, but then it's too much if you're a family of 10. So uh, like intentionally or unintentionally, uh, we do have a lot of people. So for the refugees and undocumented migrants, not only for Syrians, we will also try to capture, let's say others, for instance, Afghanis. So we will work with the CDR data, but it is extremely crucial to say that which type of big data we are working with, it doesn't matter. If you're working on migration and migrants and vulnerable groups, ethics is the most important aspect so to fulfill. And there, I guess we need to work very closely with the data scientists and the big data and the computer scientists, because I mean, uh, we are, I mean, I would say that social scientists work uh, more or let's say have more hands-on experience with these vulnerable groups so sometimes 
the ideal, I mean, you might assume that anonymization is sufficient to do that, but when you bring in the political aspect in that and the use of your data and your methods, given the rise of right wing in the overall world, I think we have to be extremely careful. In our case, what we do is we are working with the, um, one of the initiatives from MIT and Stanford, like Data Pop Alliance, and we are going to have an open algorithm system. So we are we are working with a telecom company. We are not going to have access to data, but we will be able to run authorized queries and get to results. So by this way, like uh, we try to also, uh, let's say, assure the privacy and ethical concerns. But it's a huge topic um, for for another webinar, I guess. So um, so crossing the bridge. So what are the challenges there are plenty we discussed so yes big data has a huge potential to help but i think we have to be very careful when we talk about migration statistics studying human mobility is different than keeping the statistics so yes they are related but they differ significantly so um this is uh, from uh, jimdac uh, which is the big data group of the uh, international organization for migration iom so yeah there are they already listed big data types and they made it separate for the google searches the web and the social media and the ip addresses what you see here is that there are a lot of strengths timeliness is one of them of course but when you look at the challenges you know like anonymization is a challenge let's say for instance for the mobile phone uh like self-reported information is very uh, let's say is another challenge in the geocoded social media data. And then we have the selection bias, we have the methodological issues, and we also have the continuity. So uh, most of the big data relies on internet, but if you follow what has been going on with the COVID and the education where it is online in most of the part of the Europe and in the world, we do see that several families disadvantaged families suffer because they do not have either a computer or a convenient internet access. But most of the studies with the big data, we assume that people have smartphones, they do have internet. Majority, yes, it's, it's correct. But we also have to be aware of the shortcomings and the limitations. So the self-selection bias is a different thing. You know, like we talk about, um, it is, you know, like how easy it is uh, when you sit, next to the keyboard to what you say what you talk about yourself the self-report so the, the robustness of the data is very difficult to check but this doesn't mean that big data is not good enough on the other hand i think the use of and the utilization of the big data and the ml techniques in general can be better only we acknowledge the restrictions and we work on them so to cut it short when we discuss about the definitions Yes, there are some attempts, but most of them are referring to not to, let's say, they only refer to uh, improving the in content of existing measures. But I think we should think of better ways how to develop new measures or in addition to country of birth and country of uh, nationality. So um, we do see that language is used a lot as a proxy. But when you think about getting, let's say, uh, multinational families, multilingual families, and English is being the and gaining dominance. I think, yeah, we also have to think of how we can improve our proxies there. We can work with the names. There's some they do, but it is still kind of a bias. And then geocoded information. Um, we do work, I mean, usually not too, not three sometimes we do have but with the mobile phone data it's easier because you can go to smaller grids but uh, you know like if you work with social media data uh we have to think of how to how to match it you know for 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 checking and the measurements as i said migration versus mobility is an important thing and once you are you know like titling your work or phrasing your research question i think you have to think twice if you're referring to human mobility or cross-border mobility or migration which type of migration you're referring to because they make huge differences in terms of the theoretical framework and for the typologies 
I guess what uh, big data can bring in is the self-identification because in the register, we only work with what is written on your passport, you know, like your country of birth and your country of nationality. But today we are in a world where we are free to define ourselves in terms of gender, in terms of ethnic background, in terms of religion, so or the political standing. So it is very important that big data can provide that information. Again, being aware at to what extent. And about the demography, gender and hidden populations, I think um, it is fair to say that there are several studies showing that AI is also biased. So, uh, so what, are we going to get rid of it? No, but if we know where the bias lies, I think we can try to correct for it because it is biased for culture, it's biased for gender. So there are different options, not specifically for migration, but um, if you work with the social media data or mobile phone data, for instance, we do know that especially in specific regions, women do not tend to have it, you know, like have the abundance on their name. So, you know, like the gender might be tricky, but also it is for different people who try to hide themselves. Just to give you an example, most of the refugees from Turkey, they change either their names or they distort their basic information not to be found on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter. So um, we have to be careful about the bias and missing data, but also the uh, self, like uh, we assume that these, or let's say we have to uh, make it clear that the people we are talking about, the target population is restricted to people who have access to internet, have some access to computers, whatever. So the geography and space, I think there are plenty of data availability issues with the traditional data as well as the big data because working with the telecom companies is tricky. You are, it's, I mean, I do know that there are enormous efforts in different countries like in Italy, in Spain, in Estonia. They do very nice work with working very closely with the mobile operators. Of course, not all of them, but the, maybe, the major ones. But yet, if we are talking about international migration, I think we need to have a broader picture. It comes with different costs. And for the Twitter and for the LinkedIn, you know, their privacy regulations also change a lot. So uh, it is very difficult to make sure that the data that you download is the same that it was a year ago, not in terms of content, but in terms of structure, because things are changing a lot. So the data availability is still an issue for the for the big data as well. And the temporal and timeliness, we said that it's a very responsive approach to use big data, but we also have to think of how we can have a longitudinal approach because in migration and in the processes, it's very, um, it will be extremely advantageous if we can find a way to track the process because that's one of the gaps that we have in general with the migration statistics to see the let's say the status change of people or the mob or their location changes or their aspirations uh, to move. So ethics is my final word because uh, whatever we do we have to remember that especially in the migration case this is about people your results might have a direct or indirect of on people who might come or who are willing to come to Europe or to, uh, willing to migrate. Uh, with a very specific example, the, the new migration pact tries to equalize the burden on the EU countries in terms of uh, hosting refugees. And they are, you know, like they are offering money per head. So, at the end, if you look at the intention, they really try to have more EU countries having more even more distributed refugees or let's say hosting. But whatever you find will have a direct or indirect impact on the some policies of people, uh, people's availability or capacity or the capabilities to move or to migrate. So it's extremely crucial uh, to be ethical in what we do. And um, I will share the presentation so you can also see the references for further reading. So yeah, we have the we have the report which is purely based on the gaps in theories and also the data. And there will be several papers out of it, but there are plenty of papers which are relevant. 
And I think I'm on time. And thank you very much for the patience listening to me. And I really look forward to your questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Tuba. Thank you for your talk. Uh, obviously, it's really, really interesting. And thank you also for your example because they help us to uh, to manage the issue in definition that is very tricky. And, and your example are very, very helpful. Um, meanwhile, people... Uh, chatting their their question, uh, I want to say that I enjoy I really enjoy the slide number eight on how many migrants. And you're true, you're right, because we have a very different perception of the migrant groups that are in uh, in our country. Um, I also appreciate very uh, a lot uh, the slide fourteen on gender and uh, hidden population because even if the migration research is progressing very fast, um, these groups are very less covered, still little covered. So I want, I, I want to ask you a thing. Uh, how can we reach the, this, this group? Because in Italy, for example, we, we know that we have some uh, hidden groups uh, in, uh, in our country. So, um, how can we reach them? Because it's very difficult, for example, to, uh, and is also ethically very difficult to, to identify, for example, the, the transgender. In, in Pisa, for example, we, we know that we have a small community uh, of transgender people coming from the south of America. So how can we reach, for example, these people? Can we talk with uh, a kind of community of organization how can we represent them is very is very challenging yeah very interesting and very difficult question so i'll give you two examples one of them is about the approach that we have in hummingbird for the undocumented people because it is also very difficult to reach out to them. And the second one is will be a little bit about the um, transgenders uh, because we work with LGBTI for a different project. So for the undocumented migrants, what we try to do is because we are an interdisciplinary team, you know, the first thing that I will suggest is really if you can please do work with different disciplines. So it really brings a lot of insight. So um, for the Istanbul case, what we decided to do is we are going to combine the CDR data with the satellite images, the night lights, because we do know that, you know, like the, these most of the uh, refugees and undocumented migrants, they do live in areas which are not really residential, either, you know, like uh, like old buildings or the ghetto. So what we are going to try to do is we are going to check because for the CDR data, we are working with uh, eight hours uh, periods. So we will see in the night if there is a mobile activity in specific regions, districts, very small districts, and if there is activity and if it's not a residential area, we will uh, check this with the satellite images and if we see any night lights in the area. So after several checkings and the modeling, we, we assume that if there are regular night lights on a non-residential area where we also have a regular mobile phone activity, we might assume that that, that place is uh, occupied or is a residence for the people who are not on register. So just to detect where they are. But we are also working, we are, we are also going to have qualitative researchers who are going to be working in the area. So they will have some contacts with different groups. So they will also go to that area, check. But of course, this is a very broad study. But uh, to give a more relevant example to your question, we do work with LGBTI uh, people. We try to reach out to refugees, LGBTI refugees, which are hiding as much as possible from everyone. Because usually when you work with refugees, we try to have contact with the refugee groups or some organizations who are helping them. But these people are usually trying to hide from their own communities as well. So what we do there is we um, we use Facebook. So there are some closed Facebook groups. Okay. So we first try to get into some Facebook, some open Facebook groups. I mean, not public, but, you know, like let's say these refugees in the Benelux. That's what, which is a huge group. So it is, it's especially 
the Syrians. So we first entered there and we followed up what's going on, what are they talking about, you know. Of course, um, we really hope to scrape the, the you know, discussions in the group because that would have been amazingly interesting to see the content and the NLP, you know, like what's going on there, but because of the privacy, we couldn't. But what we did, we contacted a couple of people that we see kind of extroverts. So these guys are talking a lot, trying to answer their admins, so we asked them. And then we are also in touch with the NGOs and the NGOs work very, very close with those people. In the Italian case, I will suggest you to get in um, to get in touch with CILT or CILT. I don't know how do they pronounce themselves, you know, C-I-L-D, um, because this is a legal group and they're working very close with different migrants. Usually practitioners will help you to get more information about that. I do know that computer scientists are not qualitative researchers. We don't expect you to have in-depth interviews, but it might help you to find where to seek information. So usually our method is go for the mixed methods, try to reach out to them, but we also use social media a lot because as a, I mean, in, from my point of view, I think social media is the new social capital. So they do find themselves much easier and there are always NGOs who are working with very specific groups. So reaching out to NGOs might be helpful as well. Thank you, a very good uh, answer, detailed and very helpful. And yeah, so the, the key words are communicate between researchers of different groups and communicate also with groups of people. And keep in mind that, that our people then, uh, as you uh, underline, they sometimes try also to, to, to hidden them, so it's quite difficult. Uh, so, there is there any question for the public? Yes, there is. Uh, Daniela? Sure, you can Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Perfect. Thank you for the presentation and uh, also for organizing this very interesting and relevant seminar. Uh, my question is mostly based on what you present uh, uh, in the last minutes. Uh, because you are talking big data, and we know that the research done on social media with big data, it's huge. And here I'm a little bit puzzled because you are trying to suggest that people should do interviews, which are uh, relevant, but it is a lot what uh, actually the big data uh, of this Facebook uh, you took it as an example. Uh, as I know, the most research, what is based on sentimental analysis, uh, is done on Twitter and have some migra uh, migration questions. Could you uh, say something about this? Because I'm mostly interested in learning about big data, because interviews and things like this are uh, important, but they have been used for a while. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks a lot. You know, just let, let me clarify myself. I didn't mean that you have to do interviews, not at all. I mean, my point was that if you are working on a societal challenge, okay, whatever method you use, first you need to get familiarized with what you do. So because when you talk about the hidden populations, you know, just by looking at the numbers and the definitions here and there is not going to help you to get more information. So when I said, you know, like you, that what we, what we did was not to collect information and analyze it with big data or so whatever. It's more like to to decide on, you know, like designing our study, designing a paper or a or a preliminary analysis with the, with whatever big data. It could be social media, it could be mobile phone data, or it doesn't matter. Before that, what I was suggesting is to get familiarized. So if you're talking about transgender, you have to understand what it is, you know, like where these people are, because if you do, if they are not using WhatsApp, but they are using Telegram, if they are not using Twitter, but another platform, you know, like you will not be able to find them in Twitter. So you have to know where to look for with your data. So my point is really um, to, to know more about what you're working on, because when it is a society, I think, let's say migration topic, uh, such challenges, um, big data is a tool. So you need to have a question to ask first. 
So, well, uh, so and uh, what... wait, because uh, you know, uh, I think that you are a little bit biased into this. I respect totally what you are saying, uh -huh. but given that you try to suggest something what is really dangerous, the response rate in surveys is going down to 28. All these yes. pools, web panels, yes. are very, very selective. And you might, by this way, getting very misleading information. And actually, big data, and because I'm using registered data, mm -hmm. I know how big the, the, uh, the bias uh, uh, is. Uh, mm -hmm. And I did this for a while, especially I'm analyzing migrants. And the registered data, what I'm using is Statistics Sweden. And we have information from 1960s until yeah. two years ago. And that I'm trying to suggest because here uh, you have a lot, and I, I, I repeat, do not misunderstand me. Your presentation was excellent, but I was a little bit puzzled about the fact that you didn't focus more to tell us about this big data because you took up that learning from Facebook and trying to suggest something which actually we already know that we have huge problem with because if you want to design something you know when you program is something like we are saying garbage to entry garbage to exit and that it is the bias if we start to design with huge bias then we might not get good results that it is only a suggestion and that please do not misunderstand me i like your presentation i like your way of uh, presenting but i think that one should try to be fair about uh, this and it will be very very nice if you tell us a little bit more about what you learn from the big data of facebook for example that i think that will be fair for today's topic thank you okay i mean thanks a lot i mean i'm on the same page with you i don't i don't misunderstand you at all you know like uh, to be honest, my uh, intention today, because I usually talk about this and, I, and most of my presentations are about what you can do with big data. So today I really wanted to go beyond that in, in terms of, I mean, most of, uh, maybe it was my mistake to assume that most of you are familiar with the use of big data for this topic. So I just wanted to show from, from this side where we are lacking help. So not uh, so that's why I didn't elaborate on what was done like with the Facebook data for instance with the API. Yeah, there were a lot of studies where they really estimated the number of migrants. When I say migrants and non-nationals in general, we can't find about the country of birth in different countries. And they did the robustness checks and there are several reports by the EU, but also some articles, uh, especially with the Rostock team, you know, like with Inger, um, Ingmar Webert from the Qatar and Emilio Plini from the Rostock, so they published a lot on how to use Facebook in general to estimate the international migrant stocks. So, or with the social media data, I mean, University of Pisa, I mean, the Sobic data team as well, they are doing a lot of things with, the, with, the, with Twitter for the migration statistics. And there are different users as well. For instance, today I'm referring to the migration statistics specifically, but um, let's say, you know, team, we have colleagues uh, who are working on like uh, Carlos is working on how to use hashtags if we can uh, um, how to if we can call a place a migrant friendly or not a city or a town so there are variety of applications so I'm sorry if I for your expectations maybe I will have a chance to talk about them later but here my main goal was really to see how the gaps are and what we have in hand is there but what we don't have that's why i discussed more about what you can't do or what we don't do at this stage but you're you're totally right you know like i am the i am one of the people who say that we have to be aware of the biases not only for the registered i mean samples yeah how to measure public opinion with a sample you know like the person the measurement person you know um measurement perception is a different issue the sampling frames which means whom are selected. We do know that most of these uh, groups that we are interested in are not represented. Yes, there are a lot of issues and that's why I think big data is a very good and potential solution to that. So, but I guess uh, I just wanted to push you a bit to think what can we do more than what was done? So maybe that was not clear in my abstract. So sorry for that, but my goal was to detect 
this uh, the mismatch between the existing gaps and the existing efforts. But if you're interested in me, get in touch. I can tell you way tell you way more, and I can share with a lot of information with you as well regarding that. Because I'm also working very closely with several national statistic offices, so we try to do things together. Yeah, be my guest. Please send me an email. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, I think that your answer is fair, but what I want to suggest, and I think the huge gap is here, and all us as researchers have to think about, is the fact about this response rates in surveys are going dramatically down. And uh, in that perspective, big data, it is a combination, especially that you focus on gap. But that I'm, thank you for your answer. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Of course, the, 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 the topic uh, has got a, a lot of different uh, points of view to be analyzed. So, of course, this is a presentation on what, uh, as Tuba said, what we can do and uh, which are the problem between the two different kinds of data. Uh, well, there is also another question from Gianmarco. I don't know if he's here. Well, we can. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, thank you. And uh, um, my question is about uh, the issue of uh, privacy violation, especially in uh, asking people uh, where they come from and where uh, where they go obviously in uh, not not in a situation uh, like uh, for example in uh, an extreme situation uh, like a war scenario and uh, something like this is uh, is is this a problem the is this issue considered Oh, very, very good question, in fact, because, um, you know, when we talk directly to people, you know, like when you work with big data, it is easy because there is already a declared information there and there are some, you know, like agreements of privacy. So, like people consciously or unconsciously, they click some boxes. So, and they agree with the use of the information that they provided. But when it is about asking people about where they will go, where they're coming from, what were the reasons, you know, we do work with consent forms, which means if you are going to, I mean, if I am going to talk to a refugee about their trajectory, for instance, migration trajectory, first of all, you know, like uh, I need to inform him, her about the research. So they do get a paper you know, like in their language or the language of communication, describing what my research is about, why I need that information, what am I going to do with that information, how, I mean, that assuring that the anonymity will be there so we do not get any kind of contact information or personal information. And we describe the overall structure of the talk, for instance, if you're going to talk. And then only after they agree to that, we start to talk. And they are always free to stop at any point to talk about it or not to answer. Okay. okay. But from okay. from our point, not willing to answer is a very important finding. So we can see a pattern in different people where they stop talking about a specific issue, which gives us an information about the fragility of that issue, for instance. But everything is based on consent. Okay. In fact, because my my question essentially, uh, I I think about my question because I was not sure about uh, this uh, this uh, consent. Factor. And uh, yeah, can I, I can understand that uh, uh, a crucial aspect uh, of uh, the process in gaining the, the consent to the giving and uh, so on and so forth. So yeah, exactly. Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, exactly. It's it's exactly the same with the GDPR. You know, like people should agree to have their picture posted their information collected, so they do agree everything is based on consent. Okay, uh, thank you for your answer. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. There are 
any question or I think we can uh, say thank you to Tuba. Yes. Okay, Tuba, thank you very much. Uh, we will share the uh, recording. So uh, for people who are not here, and uh, I think maybe Luca wants to say something. Yeah, thank, first of all, thank you very much, Tuba, for the very interesting talk. And uh, thank you to Laura and uh, Matteo for organizing um, uh, uh, the webinar. And uh, no, again, let me repeat that we will uh, put this video on the YouTube channel of uh, uh, So Big Data. And you know, um, see you at the next uh, So Big Data webinar that is scheduled for next month. So thank you very much again. And uh, Thank you Thanks so much for inviting me as well. It was really nice. And yeah, you can always contact me with your questions, you know, like I'm not bothered with questions. Thanks a lot. It was really fun for me as well. Have Thank a nice day. Much. Thank you, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody.